Welcome to my channel. I'm Scott and if you want to catch my newest video, I post one every day. In this video, I am going to walk you through the process of valuing Delta Airlines stock by analyzing their financial statements and dissecting their financial ratios so we can determine if it's a buy or a sell. Delta is one of the major airlines in the United States. Its headquarters are Atlanta, Georgia. The airline, along with its subsidiaries and regional affiliates, including Delta Connection, operate over 5,400 flights daily and serve 325 destinations in 52 countries on six continents. Delta is a founding member of the SkyTeam Airline Alliance. It has nine hubs, with Atlanta being its largest in terms of total passengers and number of departures. It's ranked second among the world's largest airlines in terms of passengers carried, revenue, and fleet size. Let's get started with the model. This is a large cap company, 26 billion market cap. They're trading at $40 a share and they have 638 million shares outstanding. Let's look at the financials. The way you value a company is you estimate the free cash flows into the future and then you discount those numbers back to today's value. That's what we're doing in this video. And free cash flow is cash flow from operations minus capital expenditures. So you can see the company had nice growing free cash flow from 2017 to 2019, but then it dropped a lot due to coronavirus. Net income is the profit and loss on the income statement. It's revenue minus expenses. That was also growing nicely, then had a big negative in a trailing 12 months. Revenue is a sales for the company, and it was up to $47 billion in 2019, then cut in half due to low travel in 2020. This is the company's income statement. The top line is the revenue, the sales, and below that is the cost of revenue. These are the expenses that are directly related to generating the revenue, and in the trailing 12 months, their cost of revenue was higher than their revenue, so they had negative gross profit but it peaked in 2019 at 10.4 billion. They did a really good job at cutting their operating expenses. So they had negative operating income in a trailing 12 months, but it was really strong in 2017, 18, and 19. The company does have a lot of debt, so they paid $640 million of interest on their debt, and then other income and expenses. So sometimes companies make money or lose money outside of their core operations. They had negative $10 billion in a trailing 12 months. This is most likely due to an asset impairment. In the trailing 12 months, the company had negative $10.5 billion of income. In 2019, it was almost $5 billion. This is the company's statement of cash flows. The top line is operating cash flow. That's how much cash the company generates from its operational business. Then you have capital expenditures, which are investments in property, plant, and equipment. Most of their capital expenditures are purchases of airplanes. When you take operating cash flow minus CapEx, that gives you your free cash flow. And free cash flow is a cash that's left over to pay dividends, to pay down debt, to grow your business, or to buy back stock. This company had negative free cash flow. That's why they took a lot of debt out in the trailing 12 months, almost $5.6 billion. Much more debt than prior years. The company suspended their dividend, but they used to pay a dividend and they were buying back stock. They bought back $1.7 billion in 2017, $1.6 billion in 2018, and $2 billion in 2019. When a company buys back stock, it inflates their stock price, so it does help the current shareholders. But during difficult times like coronavirus, when a company really needs cash, so then it has to go deeper into debt, they probably shouldn't have bought back stock in the first place but I guess they didn't realize coronavirus was gonna happen. The most important part of any business is their operating cash flow. Even though this company had negative $10 billion of profit, they actually only lost 1.5 billion of cash flow. And to calculate operating cash flow, you start with net income, that was 4.8 billion in 2019, and then you have to add back or subtract the non-cash items on the income statement. They had $2.6 billion of depreciation, $1.5 billion of deferred taxes. So they actually generated $8.5 billion of cash, even though they reported $4.8 billion of profit. You have to remember the income statement uses accrual accounting. So it's not cash, it's accounting profit and loss. If you want to know how much cash the company generated, 
you need to look at the statement of cash flows. Let's look at a capital structure. $15 billion of equity, $17 billion of debt. So they're 47% equity, 53% debt. And they have $14 billion of net debt. Net debt is debt minus cash. Their WAC is 9.2%, and that's a discount rate we're going to apply to the future cash flows. We estimated four years of future free cash flows. We also estimated terminal value, which is all cash flows past year for the $37 billion. We discounted those numbers back to today's new weighted average cost of capital. We get a value of the company of $33 billion. We divide that by 638 million shares. And we get a calculated stock price of $52. They're trading at $40, so they're trading at a 21% discount. It's a buy according to the model. Simply Wall Street is even higher than me. They're at $74, so they're saying the stock is even more undervalued. The expectation is people are going to start traveling a lot more in 2021 and 2022. But if they do not, then obviously the stock price won't go up. But I'm almost 100% confident travel will come back. I just don't know if it's going to come back this year or next year. No matter what happens in society, people will need to travel. They're just traveling a lot less due to coronavirus. But I think travel should get back this year to full capacity. Nobody really knows the future. It could take to 2022. The stock price was pretty steady for a few years, around $50, $60. Then it dropped a lot. It has come up a little bit since the bottom, but it's still trading at a major discount relative to its all-time high. In March 2020, the company announced it was suspending its dividend payments and stock buybacks. I wish it never bought back stock so it could have continued the dividend payments the company has a beta of 1.45, so the stock moves one and a half times the market. The stock has gone down 35% in the past 52 weeks, much worse than the S&P 500, which went up 16%. The low was 17.50, the high was 62.48. The stock is trading above its 200-day moving average, but slightly below its 50-day moving average. And this is a pretty liquid stock. 11 to 15 million shares are traded each day. And almost all the shares outstanding are on float, so they're available for investors like me and you to purchase. About 61% are held by institutions, and 2% of the shares on float are shorted. If you invested $10,000 into this company 10 years ago and reinvested the dividends, you'd have $36,000 today. If you did not reinvest the dividends, you'd have $36,500 today. So if you invested $10,000 into this company in January 2011, you would have been down to seven, eight, nine thousand dollars right off the bat, and you probably would have sold because you got disgruntled. But if you would have held on, you could have sold at fifty thousand dollars. But even if you're still holding now, you still have a decent return on investment. In the past ten years, the stock has gone up fourteen percent each year on average. The biggest shareholder is Vanguard at ten and a half percent, then BlackRock at five point six percent, then PrimeCap, State Street, and Capital Research. Let's look at the financial ratios. The average P.E. in the market is 11.7. The median is 14.8. P.E. is stock price over earnings per share. To calculate earnings per share, that's net income over shares outstanding. They have negative net income, so they have negative P.E. Price of sales is stock price over sales per share. They're at 1.1, so they have a really good price sales ratio. That means investors are paying $1.10 for $1 revenue. Price to book is stock price over book value per share. They're at 1.7, really good price to book ratio. And the way you calculate book value per share, it's equity over shares outstanding. Equity is assets minus liabilities in the balance sheet, and they have $15 billion of equity, but only $400 million of tangible equity because they have nearly $15 billion of intangible assets on their balance sheet. Intangible assets are the result of acquisitions, $9.8 billion of goodwill and $5.2 billion of other. Interest coverage ratio is EBIT over interest expense. They have negative EBIT, so they have negative interest coverage ratio. ROE is net income over equity. Negative net income, negative ROE. Current ratio is current assets over current liabilities. They can only cover 40% of their current liabilities with their current assets. Their current assets are 3 billion of cash, 3 billion of receivables, and 1.3 billion of inventory. The company will need more funding over the next 12 months because they had negative $4 billion of free cash flow, plus they have negative $12 billion of working capital. Working capital is current assets minus current liabilities. 
The best way to look at ratios to compare them is similar companies. I've done videos on American Airlines, Air Canada, Alaska, Copa, Exchange, JetBlue, Southwest, Spirit, SkyWest, and United. All in the same industry as Delta. And if Delta has a number in red, they're worse than the average. If they have a number in green, they're better than the average. So they're worse in PE because they're negative. Their price of sales is a little worse than average. Price to book is much better than average because average is negative due to American. They have a terrible current ratio, a terrible ROE. They're about average in debt, and they are bigger than the average company. The average company is 9.3 billion market cap. They're 25 billion, and they don't pay a dividend. So to summarize, I do have them trading at a 21% discount, because even though they're struggling, they're such a big airline, I think they're gonna really do well when things start to open up. And they had really strong numbers in 2019, 18, and 17. So I don't see why they can't get back to those numbers in 2022. 2021 may be a break-even year. So let me know what you think. Give this video a like, subscribe, or comment below. Also, if you'd like to get a custom valuation or just support the channel, you can become a member by clicking on the link in the description below. Thanks for watching.